Good evening, and welcome to Galesburg Nazarene. Uh, this is our Bible uh, Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time. And today is April 12th, 2023, and last Sunday was Easter. I hope we all had a wonderful day celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for the, the warmth, the sunshine, the wind, and the beauty of your creation. Lord, we thank you that you continue to make us new, that you make us new creations in Christ Jesus. So tonight I pray that you would open up our hearts to all that you have for us, and that your word would bear fruit in our lives, and as we interact with other people, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Um, anyway, we have been going over prayer uh, last month or so, and uh, I just really appreciate the opportunity to talk more about it. Uh, the last couple of weeks we looked into the throne of grace and the sacrifice Jesus made with his death so that we can have access to a holy God that is our Heavenly Father. And so uh, as we've discussed um, prayer and communication with God, um, it's not just simply saying grace over a meal, an invocation at a meeting, are a nightly list of needs presented to God. I mean, it can be those things, but prayer is so much more than that. But it's also a dialogue with God. Um, and if you work with children, and most of us are uh, parents or grandparents or something, the easiest way to describe prayer is just talking to God. And, and it really is that simple. Um, talking to God, having a dialogue with Him just as we would a friend. Um, and some of us uh, may have a car that we can connect our phone to, and that's called Bluetooth, where you can connect your phone to something else. But as we're driving in a car, um, we can connect our phone to uh, come through the speakers, and you can talk to somebody hands-free. Uh, we can drive and talk at the same time. And our relationship with God can, can be like that somewhat, connecting with God in any moment of our life. Uh, we don't need to press the button. We don't need to hold the phone to our ear. All we have to do is call out to God, and he's there. Um, Psalm 34, 6 says this, This poor man called out, and the Lord heard him. He saved him from all his troubles. I like the word poor. That's what it says in the NIV. But other, um, the, the Greek has different nuances to that definition of poor. It can be afflicted, needy, or humble. So yeah, I think all of that applies. We can be afflicted, needy, and humble all at the same time. This poor, afflicted, needy, humble person called out, and the Lord heard him, saved him from all his struggles. Now the whole chapter of Psalm 34 and other Psalms talk about calling out to God, and he hears us. His ear is tuned to us. God is waiting for our call. Um, Jesus talks about childlike faith. 
Uh, he rebuked the disciples for trying to keep the children from him, bring the children to me, don't deny them that, because he says such is the kingdom of heaven that we must all become like little children. And I think sometimes as we grow older, we lose that childlike approach to our Heavenly Father, especially as it, as it regards to prayer. And I believe many of us want to pray in the right manner. And, and nothing wrong with learning a pattern of prayer, you know, how to pray in different circumstances, in formal settings and things like that. And Jesus, if, you know, we know the Lord's Prayer. Jesus gave us a, a, a great pattern to follow in the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, we think about it, sometimes we do get caught up in thinking that I have to pray a certain way in a group or something. And certainly if someone is praying over a couple as they get married or praying at a funeral, those types of prayers are going to be very, very specific. And there might be something that you want to specifically mention and how you do it. It, it. it would be a casual type of thing. But actually, I think that's instead of talk, thinking about the impact of prayer, that's kind of more a prayer appropriateness or prayer etiquette. There's a time and a place for certain kind of prayers, a formal prayer at a funeral, a formal prayer at a wedding or baby dedication. But prayer can be so much more than that. So what I want to talk about tonight, I don't want to confuse prayer etiquette with a prayer relationship with God. They're two different things. And we each can have, we have that ability, each of us, no matter how long we've known the Lord, whether we accepted Christ just a second ago, or we've known him for decades, we all have that opportunity for prayer relationship with him because of that access that we have to the throne of grace. And we might feel a little awkward praying in a group or praying uh, in a, some other setting, but none of us should feel awkward about praying to God, even if, if it's just us at home at the kitchen table. And it shouldn't, prayer should not be complex. And so evil wants nothing more than to make our prayer relationship with God complex. And because if he can do that, then he has built some roadblocks or stumbling blocks to keep us from praying or, help, or making us feel awkward. You know, social media has kind of redefined the concept of friendship. I think all of us would agree with that. Um, you know, uh, sometimes we get notifications that, that I've been friends with my sister for 15 years now. And, and I, I think that's funny because I guess before Facebook, I was only her sibling. I was not her friend. So, it, you know, it... Uh, so, you know, I guess the only time we acknowledge friendships is on social media. But I, I remember it, when I first joined Facebook years ago, I thought, wow, you know, if I get 50 or 100 people that could be my friend, that would be a lot. Um, but you know what? I found that you really don't have to be friends, friends with people for to accept their friendship on Facebook. Um, and it's some people, you know, I've even seen that they have like a thousand or fifteen hundred. And I'm like, do you really know those people? Do you really want to share your personal information with all those people? Um, and I would say at the very least, if you if you go into Facebook and have that many friends, we could call them superficial friends. So that you know, that's it's that's a little bit. Um, you know, I really don't think they're friends. So this, these friends are not the type of friends the Bible calls that stick closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24 says this, um, one who has, an, has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's the NIV, but the Amplified Bible expounds upon that. It says the man of too many friends, that is those that are chosen indiscriminately, will be broken in pieces and come to run. But there is a true loving friend who is reliable and sticks closer than a brother. So the number, the more number we have to say, I'm just gonna have friends, gather them all in there.
but really the, the goal is to have a true friend that sticks closer than a brother. So let's, let's just kind of throw that modern concept of social media friendship out the window. And, um, and let's just for a moment think about what a true friend is. And so what do friends, uh, this is what a friend won't do. They won't drop you for someone else, uh, take something from you, um, talk, talk about you behind your back. Um, you know, those are things that some, some people can do that may call your friends, but truly a true friend is not going to do that. So a true friend, though, will listen. They will hear the tough stuff, stick with you even if it doesn't benefit them, understand your moods, help you through troubling times, help you with some needs, and they, in the long haul, will, they truly will help you become a better person. Now, we all know that our friends, um, they're, they're imperfect too. They have their limitations and they aren't perfect. Um, sometimes they're, they have needs too. They themselves, and maybe they're having a tough time, and they can't always be there for us. They have their flaws, and people change, we move on. So let's talk about friendship with God. Um, Moses, in Exodus 33, 11, and I, I like the way the scripture puts this, and the scripture was fulfilled, uh, no, I skipped something. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. This is Old Testament, and, and, and this is the same guy. Moses is the same guy that killed an Egyptian and ran into the desert. desert. And uh, when God had entered into Moses' life, he was pretty much a diamond in the rough. But God spoke to him as a friend. Uh, let's see what God says about Abraham. In James 2, 23, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Now, Abraham was also the person who tr tried to play off his wife as his sister to a king to protect himself. So he basically was playing, you know, so when we look at the Bible, uh, we find that friendship with God doesn't require perfection. Uh, but but it, we look at friendship with God as a journey. Enoch, um, in Genesis 5, 24, Enoch walked faithfully with God, and he was no more because God took him away. He walked with God. Noah, in Genesis 6, 8 through 9, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people at his time, and he walked faithfully with God. So Enoch and Noah both walk faithfully with God. Now walking with God, what does that look like? Um, and today we don't even think about that as much, but back then the most common mode of transportation was walking. Uh, some used horses and donkeys, and some may have even had chariots, but walking was the most common method of getting from one place to the other. And so today we might call it driving with God. Um, have you ever been on a long, hard trip all alone? However, if you have a companion, it makes the journey easier. Our journey with God is very similar. If he's in the car with us, and we're talking, and we're going through it, he, he's, remember uh, in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You're not going to, as you're driving along, God's not going to be condemning you all the way. He's going to be encouraging you, helping you, and working with you. It's interesting that many of these Old Testament personalities had these great relationships with God. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses. But when Jesus worked with his disciples, he has to teach them how to pray. And I, I find that interesting because obviously, Moses, God talked to Moses as, uh, as a friend would. Same with Abraham. And so could it be that the religious systems of the Pharisees and the scribes had become so form formulaic that they collectively lost the passion for God that people like David and Moses did? And I, I find that, you know, we can't allow our religion to become so formulae or 
to-do list. And I think that's what happened with the, the Israelites when the time when Jesus came. Their religion was one of a checklist. I did this, 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 and I didn't do this, 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 and this, and so therefore, I'm all good. But they missed the heart of it. They missed the heart of what God was talking about in the heart of the law. Jesus calls us friends. In John chapter 15, verses 12 through 15, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. So when Jesus tells us in this command to love each other as he loved us, the word love here is the Greek agape, meaning unconditional. We are God's friends if we do what he's commanded. So what is he commanded? But for us to unconditionally love one another. Christ's example was to lay down his life for us. Now, I don't think he literally wants us to do that. But what does it mean to unconditionally love someone? And that may look different for each of us as we unconditionally love people. And unconditional love, it's not just saying, I love you. I mean, that could be part of it. But really, um, there's a, a, a song that um, DC Talk did years ago and says, love is a verb. You know, it, it's not a noun. Love is, is not, it is a thing, but love is something in action, unconditional love. <coughs> so the acts of love that spring from unconditional love will look different for each of us, but I'm pretty certain that as we unconditionally love others, it would include a personal sacrifice in some way, just as Christ did. So that friendship, as God has commanded us to love one another, he's our friend, we become his friend as we continue to fulfill his mission that he had when he was here on earth of loving people unconditionally and doing things for them. I think sometimes we think, are overwhelmed with what could I do that could compare with what Christ did with his work on the cross. But I don't think God expects us to, you know, Jesus, he only died once, but there were little things he did along the way that we very much could, you know, offer somebody a kind word, give somebody 20 bucks when they're short on gas money. There's just a lot of things that we can do for people that offer a, a sacrifice. But as God says, Jesus says, you are my friend if you unconditionally love each other. However, God takes friendship one step further. We are not only friends, but his children. For, and John tells us this in 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished and other bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Now, some translations translate the word lavish, sumptuously rich, elaborate, or luxurious. Whatever, that we, that God would lavish upon us. You know, let's not take this for granted. We were, we were debtors, we were slaves to sin before we came to know God. And then when we accept Jesus, we become his friend, we become children of God. Romans 8 Verses 14 through 17. But those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And Abba is the Aramaic word for Daddy. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, we are his heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So we are 
God's friend. We're also his children. We are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. We have the opportunity to have that great companionship, friendship, but we also are just designed, designated heirs on par with Christ himself. And I find that absolutely amazing that we, we are frail human beings. We suffer, we are made from dust, and yet God makes us on par with his son. And the interesting thing about God, and, and we go back to Moses, the example I had of Moses and uh, Abraham. They were not perfect. Uh, you know, they made their mistakes, they had their flaws. But you know, the interesting thing about God is he can take the tough, tough stuff. He can take the, the, we don't think of it as prayer, but he can, he can take our complaining, if that's a, a, for lack of a better word, but as we think about entering into God's throne room, uh, we're not seen as a slave, but as a friend and a child of God. And so it, it may be hard for to wrap our head around the fact that the Almighty God even allows us this type of relationship. He doesn't need us. God doesn't need us. But he loves us deeply. And when we have this open relationship with him, and I was thinking about that today, um, he doesn't need us, but when we have this open relationship with him, it brings glory to God. Because the, the New Testament talks about how the church is, is, as the church functions, it manifests glory. God gets the glory because of, he works through us. But as we honor God by having this relationship with him, it brings glory to God and it fulfills us in the most deepest way, the way in which God intended us to have fellowship, friendship as a child of him. See, sin is not something that God ever wanted, but he knew that we live in a battle. But as we surrender to him, we have that unbroken companionship and friendship that God intended in the first place. So let's look at how God interacted with Moses and get a first-hand account and see how God really can't take the tough the tough stuff. Numbers 11, 10 through 15. Moses, uh, now these, the children of Israel out in the desert, they, um, they've been bad. So that's just kind of a little prep here. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. The Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. Now this is the conversation that Moses has with God. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arm? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath unto their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes, and do not let my face, don't let me face my own run. So he's having a very frank conversation with God. God, you put me in this position. These are your people. They're here. You wanted me to lead them. And, <laughs> and he's just having a, you know, God can take it. And I think that's me. You know, we can have these conversations with God. Yeah, you know, you have to wonder if Moses is thinking back to that burnish, burning bush moment when he told God he wasn't up to the task. But you know, God was angry with the children of Israel too. Moses was doing some heavy complaining to God, and God didn't strike him dead. God knew the limitations of Moses. He also knew Moses' frustration. He had created Moses too. However, God also knew that his plan for salvation was going to come through this stubborn group of people. These complainers in the desert. And remember, God had to have a way. And we think about the children of Israel and how sometimes they were stiff-necked and stubborn. And they're, they're described in the Bible many times this way. But God needed a stiff-necked, stubborn people to carry that message through to get to Jesus. And Jesus was born from this race of people. So despite... The, the personality difficulties that this nation had. They were the per people that God brought salvation to the whole world through. 
and God can work miracles. He worked miracles in this family. And, and the thing is, is that at any point in time, as you look through, as, as God was weaving this pattern of bringing Jesus about, um, even in the time of Elijah, Elijah felt like he was the only one, and, he, and there were thousands of other people that had not bowed their knee to Baal. There was always a remnant that kept himself pure. But in a way, Moses was complaining to God about these complainers. Um, in the next portion of the scripture, God answers Moses. But Moses also asks of God a special favor. And this is it's quite a lengthy passage. This is Exodus 33, verses 12 through 23. And uh, this is the children of Israel. He had already gone up to the mountain, received the Ten Commandments, come down, found them worshiping the idols, and had gone back up to redo this. And this is when uh, this is where he's talking to God again. In Exodus 33, verses 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, leave these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, Your presence does not go with us. Do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses says, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you can stand on the rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Now that's the end of Exodus 33, and then it goes into Exodus 34, where he talks about getting the tablets ready, but then in verse 6 of 34, uh, after God had instructed him to prepare the tablets, God does show Moses his glory. In verse 6 it says, And then he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And then he goes on to outline some things there, but Moses, he's having a pretty frank dialogue again. You know, here he says, if you, remember, this is your nation, your people. He keeps putting that back up to, to, to God. And even though Moses is having these, he's, he, he, you can almost tell he's questioning God. Why did you put me here? Why did you get me in this situation? I don't know what I'm doing here. And God said, I I'm pleased with you. I'm going to give you what you've asked. And again, this friendship with God and this dialogue isn't based upon Moses' perfection. It's based upon this love that God has for him and for his people. Moses was designed to be the leader of those people. And one of the things that we see in our lives, we not, you know, we're not, I'm not Moses, I don't want to be Moses, I want to want that responsibility. But God has people that he's put in my life that he wants me to be Jesus to. And sometimes I don't know what I'm doing, but I pray for these people and I talk to God and, you know, I don't have to be perfect in how that all works out, but I have this friendship with God. And so we, we take the, what Moses did here, and Moses maybe, I don't know, you could look at it and think he was a little bit arrogant talking to God. I, God, I'm not getting this. These are your people. Why'd you put me here? You know, and I'm not saying that's what we should do to God, but what I'm saying is that God is very patient. He was very patient with Moses. He was very patient with the children of Israel. 
He's going to be patient with us because he knows, I, I like Psalm 103, he says, he does not treat us as our sins deserves. He remembers that we are made from dust. So we have this relationship and it was just real. Moses just opened up and talked to God. And so last night, it, it's interesting, last night, um, my husband Mike and I were sitting out underneath the stars um, and it was beautiful. And you know, we think about dialogue with God as like we're, you know, me talking right now, but only God could create something so beautiful as the carpet of stars, just the, just the beauty of it. And, and we think that maybe God speaks to only in language form. But last night, looking at the beautiful stars, God spoke to me through the beauty and magnificent of his creation. That he created the grandeur of the stars to display his glory but he also created the grandeur of the stars for us, to show us who he is. And so we can look at that and say, this is the fingerprint of God, and know that this is the glory of God. And in and, and Romans, it talks about that his divine qualities and eternal power are in creation. All we have to do is look at it. And so God doesn't necessarily talk to us in lecture form. He displays his glory in what we have in this world. And the beautiful sunsets, waterfalls, mountains, the, the beauty, and then the beauty, you know, we are God's workmanship too. Psalm 139, for he has created me, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We just look at the complexity of the human body and know that God God is telling us that he cares for us because he has all these little things in our body that work to protect us from sickness. One verse in particular that I love, this is Jeremiah 33.3. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. I love this verse. It tells me that I can call out to God and he can tell me things I can't find anywhere else. You know, I, I, I could have the most complicated, intelligent internet search engine. Or I could sign up for the most sophisticated, exploring uh, safari group and I can't, I can't go places and I can't find things on the internet that God can reveal to me. Only God can. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. You know, I think that's what Moses was doing. I think that's what Abraham did. I think that's what Enoch did. David did it. Jesus did as he walked this earth. And the early disciples learned to depend upon Jesus. It became real for them. It was a personal relationship. So are you calling out to God? Are you asking him to show you unsearchable things that we can't find on the internet, that we can't find by walking in some safari? Are you calling out to God? We, not, we may not be the big lawgiver of the Old Testament, but God is call, call, God longs to call for us to call on him, for us to be his friend, to be his child. We already have earned that if we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, but we have to take hold of it. We have to grasp that in our life. Jesus tells us that we are no longer servants, but God's friends and John and Paul tell us that we are God's children as co-heirs with Christ. God wants us to have this relationship. He wants us to take advantage of all the perks that we have. We have a wonderful place of authority as believers as we come into God's throne room. But most importantly, we have that wonderful friendship with Jesus that can't be taken away from us. And that as we develop that friendship with Jesus and we walk with him, I can't help but think that that friendship shines through to us and works and changes people's lives as they see Jesus mean something to us. That is our hope. That is our hope. It's not just that we've been saved from our sins, but that we have this eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. Anyway, 
I hope that you do call out to God. And right now, this is time for our prayer time. Does anybody here in the sanctuary have any special prayer requests? Raleigh? Okay, we need to remember Brent Abel, who has, uh, has some cancer. Uh, Sterling? Uh, Linda Christensen, Chris, I just talked a moment ago. She had an operation last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's been in a lot of pain, but she, she says she's getting on real good now. It's off today. And I just waiting to take all the, all the skins and the things. We need to remember, remember Linda Christensen in prayer. She had surgery last week, but she's doing better. You got praise from Donna? lovely weather, just thankful. We do need to remember the, the family. Uh, we need to pray for John. John, uh, Anna, who does our uh, tech, is having a really bad migraine today. So we need to lift him up. We also need to be in prayer for the families. The, the two girls, one was uh, hurt bad, and the other girl passed away. Um, uh, a junior, she, her name is Faith, and she went to Spoon River, and she was a junior this year. And we need to remember that family in prayer. And Dave Shane Winter is home from the hospital. We need to continue to remember him in prayer. And Diane Oliver. We need to remember her in prayer. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. A lot of needs, a lot of unspoken needs. We're so thankful that you, we can come before you with our needs and we just lift them up to you. Lord, we thank you for the way that you care for our needs and that you take care of us. And Lord, specifically, we lift up Brett Gable, who has cancer. Lord, help him as he deals with this. I pray that the treatment would work well. Help him emotionally and the Lord provide for the insurance and the medical care. Lord, we thank you for working in the life of Donna and her, her family and all the answers to prayers that you're providing and that yeah. things are going forward with their family. We just praise you for that. Lord, we lift up Linda Christensen to you. Lord, we thank you that you were with her in her surgery, that she's getting better, that she's on, uh, on the mend in terms of the, uh, the progress. Lord, we continue to lift up Diane Oliver to her and her needs uh, help her. Lord, we thank you that you're helping Dave Shane Wetter, that he's home from the hospital. Lord, we lift up John Anna, who has a terrible migraine today. Lord, just touch and heal him, help him with that. Give him comfort and give him peace. Lord, we thank you for his faithfulness to our church. Lord, we pray that you would be with this family that lost their daughter at the age of 16 in a terrible accident. Bring healing and comfort to their hearts and help them in this time. We also pray for the other girl that was hurt severely. Bring healing to her body. Be in this whole situation, God. And Lord, we just pray for all the different things that are going on in our church. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in bringing us Pastor Jim Book. We pray that you continue to help him, bless him. Open up the door for him, Lord, so that he... Uh, that he can retire here shortly. Lord, I praise you that you're working in his life. We thank you for his willingness to lead our church. We thank you for Pastor Lloyd Brock, our district superintendent, who has worked with us and helped us as we continue to look for a, a pastor here. Lord, we praise you that you're opening up doors and that you're going to work through that. Lord, we also pray that you would just continue to um, bless our church, help us to go forward. And Lord, it's not dependent upon any one person. But Lord, we do praise you that you've established a position in our church 
as lead pastor. And Lord, we pray that you would fulfill that position and bring that bright person in here that would unite us together as a body of believers. Lord, we thank you for those who are already serving our church, Lord, in a pastoral role. We thank you for Bonnie and Raleigh. We thank you for their faithfulness to our church, that you encourage them and bless them. Lord, that you continue to fulfill your purpose through them and the different things that they do, especially with discipleship and, and the adult ministries. Lord, we lift up Shelly and we pray, God, that you would continue to help her as she works with the youth. Lord, I pray that you would bless her, give her wisdom, especially as she's trying to find people to fill different roles. Lord, I pray that you would bring those people there, that they would be an inspiration, a blessing to children, that the children, that you would bless our children and, and the different activities that they do in Sunday school and Bible quizzing. I praise you, God, that these programs are here and that you're fulfilling your purpose through our church and building your kingdom through them. Lord, I pray that you be with John Van Howe and our youth. Lord, continue to work through him and help him. And Lord, we thank you for the group of people that help him. Lord, I pray a special hedge protection around our teenagers in this culture that we live in. Protect them from the ideologies that they are contrary to you, God. Lord, we praise you that you are working with them and protecting them. And as they interact with other people, Lord, that they would be strong, that they would stand true to the word of God, that there would be no confusion in their hearts and minds about who they are in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you that every ministry that we have in this church, Lord, that it be touched and bathed in, a, in the Holy Spirit and the word of God. And that the blood of Jesus would cover over every aspect of uh, activity, every building, every person. That you would protect us, protect us from evil in, in terms of to discredit us. And Lord, we saw how the early church faced so much persecution. But Lord, at every step that, the, that, that evil tried to stop, Lord, the church just grew. The church grows and, and, and your promise to Peter is still true today. And that the, the gates of Hades cannot prevail against the church. And Lord, I pray that you would help Galesburg Nazarene to grow and that the power and the blood of Jesus Christ would, would be fulfilled through us, Lord, that we would praise you, that we would honor you, Lord. We praise you that you are working in our church to build your kingdom. Lord, I thank you for the way that you provide for us financially. We praise you, God, that you help us pay the bills. And Lord, you know, it, it's that step-by-step -step faith, Lord, that you are working to, to change our world and that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. And so, Lord, we pray as, as we are obedient to you that you provide what we need to minister to those around us and to each other. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of you. We thank you for your creation. We thank you for the way that you allow us to interact with creation and, uh, and, and build things and create things and do things, Lord, that help build your kingdom too. So Lord, I pray that we would not get lost in a to-do list and a don't list, but Lord, that we would look at that personal relationship with you and have that dialogue with you and not be afraid to express our frustrations to you and surrender them to you and allow you to work in our lives. God, I just praise you for that opportunity to be frustrated before you. And Lord, that you take us and patiently work through us and mold our hearts. Help us to be pliable in your hands, that we would shape and love you and shape our lives to reflect you and that we be walk day in and day out and become more Christ-like. And Lord, if there's anything I've forgotten, Lord, there's so many needs here, but Lord, we know that you're working through each and every one of them. And Lord, I thank you for the way that you work in our church, the way you work in our lives. Give us safety. Help us as we go out into the world. Go out into the world and Jesus would shine through us. We give you the glory, the praise, and your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.